and chemistry. Okay, chemistry 3101. This is chapter nine, which is alkynes. We only have a couple chapters left <clears throat> in organic chemistry one after this. Chapter 10 deals with radical chemistry, and chapter 11 is just a review of all the different synthetic reactions that we look at. So alkynes, and of course you all know what an alkyne is, right? You know the difference between an alkyne and an alkene, right? We learned that way back in chapter one, that when you have a triple bond between two carbons, we have an alkyne. So if the two carbons in the triple bond, if they're flanked by R groups, we call that an internal, internal alkyne. It's again between two R groups. But when you have a hydrogen on one of the carbons like this, we call this a terminal alkyne, a terminal alkyne. And we probably will actually spend more time talking about terminal alkynes than we do al internal alkynes. Why is that? It's because this proton has a pK of 25, so it's acidic enough that we can deprotonate it and do some pretty interesting chemistry with it. And also, when we um, make alkynes, most of the time we're going to be making terminal alkynes, and I'll explain why that is later on. So there you go. Right away, we already saw there's a difference between an internal alkyne and a terminal alkyne. So alkynes, they possess that carbon-carbon triple bond, and we know that both of the carbons um, are sp hybridized, right? They're sp hybridized. So what we have here, these gray lobes represent the two sp orbitals, and you can see that we have an unhybridized p orbital here, and we have another unhybridized p orbital there. And we talked about hybridization um, at length in chapter one. So make sure you understand the hybridization of the carbon in that triple bond, right? We've got one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Remember that the first bond between two atoms is always a sigma bond, okay? So the first bond is always a sigma bond, so this is a sigma bond. Anything after a sigma bond, both of these are considered pi bonds. Now, it doesn't matter if I was to put the arrow here on the bottom one or the middle one or the top one, that's neither here nor there, that's not important. But the first bond between two atoms will always be a sigma bond and anything after that is a pi bond. So um, the fact that an alkyne has two pi bonds gives it some unique properties. It says, given the presence of those pi bonds, alkynes are similar to alkenes in their ability to behave as a nucleophile. So we can actually take a pair of electrons um, from that pi bond and they can act as a nucleophile like that. So we think of an alkyne, we can think of it as being a nucleophile. We can also think of it as being a Lewis base because it's an electron donor. Um, and we're also going to see that many of the reactions that we saw way back in chapter eight with alkenes, so this would be chapter eight, they're going to work on alkynes, which is chapter nine. Some other points that I want to make here is you should know that when we have an sp hybridized carbon, that the geometry here is linear. The bond angle is 180 degrees, and of course, it's 180 degrees here as well. And because of that, it's very difficult to put a triple bond in a ring. So we don't, you know, right? We saw double bonds in rings all the time. For example, we saw something like cyclohexene, right? We use this as a starting material many times. But you can't put a triple bond in a six-membered ring. It just won't happen. It doesn't fit because the carbons need to adopt that linear geometry. And in fact, our textbook does mention that the smallest ring that you can have with a triple bond in it is actually called cyclonanine. So there would be um, nine carbons in that ring and you're able to squeeze a, a triple bond in there. Anyhow, alkynes in industry and nature. Well, acetylene is the simplest alkyne. The structure of acetylene is this, okay? I mean, the systematic name is ethyne, so ethyne is the systematic name. However, acetylene is the common name, and common names are called common for a reason, because that's what people generally will call them. So acetylene is a molecule that we're going to use all the time in this chapter. You can abbreviate it like this. Remember that in a condensed structure, you cannot leave out um, a double or a triple bond, so we have to indicate that. So acetylene, and what is acetylene used for? Well, you know, when I think of acetylene, I always think of um, a welding. You know, if you've done any welding before with an acetylene torch, um, the reason why acetylene is so great as a gas for welding is because it burns at around 2,800 degrees Celsius. So you get this really hot flame and maybe you've done some acetylene welding. I did some in junior high, actually, of all places. In Canada, we had, you know, a shop class where we get to do a little bit of welding. Anyhow, it says more than a thousand different alkyne natural products 
have been isolated. Now, that might seem like a really big number. You're like, wow, a thousand. That's a lot of molecules. Well, compared to alkenes, it's actually a very small number. So there's not nearly as many um, uh, naturally occurring alkynes as there are alkenes. But here's a really interesting one. And I mentioned this one before I started recording the video. This is history of nicotoxin. And this comes from the poison dart frog, which is dendrobates. History, his, uh, and, uh, anyhow, I forget how to pronounce the second word, but anyhow, this comes from the poison dart frog. And what makes this compound so interesting is that it's got two triple bonds, you know. And again, we don't find that many compounds in nature that have triple bonds in them. So kind of cool there. Anyhow, let's talk about the nomenclature of alkynes. And the good news is this, you know, you're getting towards the end of organic chemistry one. You're tired. You're like, I can't take any more information. Well, the good news is this. If you understood the nomenclature of alkynes and alkenes, you know, um, you're going to be able to name an, uh, sorry, alkenes and alkanes, you're going to be able to name an alkyne with minor modifications, okay? So again, if you understood the nomenclature of alkanes and alkenes, um, naming an alkyne won't be that bad. So what's the first thing we're going to do? Like an alkene, we're going to find the longest carbon chain, but it's got to include that carbon-carbon triple bond, okay? Same as we saw with alkenes, again. Then we identify and we name our substituents. We have an isopropyl, an isobutyl, a secbutyl, whatever, a chloro, a fluoro, what have you. And then we assign a locant. Remember that a locant in organic chemistry is just a tatsy name for a number. So 2-methyl, 3-ethyl, whatever. So you assign a locant and a prefix, whether it's mono, di, tri, et cetera. And you want to give the carbon-carbon triple bond the lowest number possible. Don't worry about the rest of the substituents. This is something that students do from time to time. They think it involves tallying up numbers and getting an abacus out and maybe a mainframe computer, but no, you just want to give the first carbon in the triple bond the lowest number possible. Then you put the substituents in alphabetical order. You ignore prefixes except iso, cyclo, and neo, okay, um, when ordering alphabetically. The carbon-carbon triple bond locant can be put either just before the parent name or just before the ion suffix. So, um, I'm going to show you how to do this in an, in an example so that you'll know what's going on. So if we just, you know, kind of look at a picture, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. If we look at a picture of the first rule, it says identify that parent chain, but it's got to have the triple bond in it, right? Here we have pentane. Everybody knows that. Here we have one pentene. If you have the, the double bond on the first carbon like this, one, two, three, four, Five. And then here we have one pentine, right? Because the triple bond starts on the first carbon. One, two, three, four, five, like this. Notice that when you're drawing an alkene, you still have the zigzag format because the two carbons in the double bond are sp2 hybridized and they have trigonal planar geometry. So it's perfectly normal to draw them in the zigzag pattern, right? Because all the bond angles are 120 degrees. But notice how you draw these three carbons in a row for the alkyne, right? You've got to make sure to have a linear geometry for this carbon, and they've left this hydrogen out, of course, but you've got to make sure that that's a linear geometry, right? If you try to put a zigzag here, and I see students do that usually towards the beginning of the class, that's technically incorrect, you know, to draw, and don't draw this, but if you try to draw a triple bond and then you draw something like this from it, this is, this is incorrect, right? Because, again, the hybridization of the carbon in the triple bond is sp, and it has a linear geometry. Check this one out here. Here we have a molecule. We just find the longest carbon chain. It's got eight carbons, good. But you can see that we have an eight carbon chain in this molecule, but it's not considered the parent chain. Why? Because it doesn't possess that triple bond. We've got to have that triple bond, right? So if we number this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have a propyl group at carbon three. So this would be three, let me write it down here. This would be 3-propyl-1, and I'm running out of space here, 1-heptine. I'll try to squeeze it in here, 1-heptine. And what it meant in the last rule here, in rule number five, is you could call that 3-propyl-1-heptine, or you could call it 3-propyl-3-propyl-heptine. Three propyl, three okay? So you can just put the you can put the locant right before the suffix if you want to. I don't do that a lot, but sometimes you see that 
in different textbooks or maybe in the scientific literature, depending on, or the internet, you know, depending on where you're looking, you know, people have their preferences or their, maybe their reasons. Uh, here's an example of assigning the carbons in the triple bond, the lowest possible numbers, right? We have all these substituents here. We've got a couple of methyls here, another one here, but you see that the person who numbered the carbons in the longest parent chain, they made sure to give the first carbon of the triple bond the lowest possible number, which is a two. Whereas in the second example, it's wrong, isn't it? Right, because the person was maybe thinking, well, I wanna give this first substituent the lowest possible number. That's how you would name an alkane, right? But remember with an alkyne or an alkene, it doesn't work that way. We wanna give the carbons in the triple bond the lowest possible number. Uh, what else? Listing the um, substituents uh, in alphabetical order. That's usually not a big deal with my students. So I'll put my exceptions in here. And then again, I just demonstrated the whole suffix um, uh, rule that you can put the locant uh, before the parent name, right, which would be heptine, or you could put it right before the suffix, which is ine. Again, either one is totally acceptable. There's nothing wrong with either of them. Well, I'm sure that you've all kind of figured this out by now, you know. Usually at this point, my students have, you know, spent time reading the textbook, listening to me, looking at the slides, trying some practice problems, and probably poking around the internet sometimes, you know, like, oh, I'll listen to see what somebody else has to say about this, or I'll read, you know, something else. Well, you've probably noticed by now that in organic chemistry, common names are a big deal. They just are, and it's something we can't, you know, we can't... Um, negate it it's they're just they're common for a reason right people use them all the time now i told you that acetylene was the simplest possible alkyne so that's just this molecule here two carbons with a triple bond in between them so sometimes we'll name alkynes as derivatives of acetylene oh the only time we ever do that though is when the alkyl group is something that you can name really quickly right here you have a methyl group on your acetylene. So you can call it methyl acetylene. I mean, that's again, a common name. The IUPAC or the systematic name, I should say, would be propine. So this would be propine. Um, but again, methyl acetylene is totally acceptable. Here you have diisopropyl acetylene. I mean, we could also give this a, a, a name too. You have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So this would be two, five dimethyl, three hexyne. All right, but you can see that diisopropyl acetylene rolls off the tongue much faster. And then the next one, you have phenylpropyl acetylene, which is way faster than trying to give it a, um, a systematic name, which you could do as well. Okay, and we're going to do some nomenclature practice before we move on to the next section. And on the first slide today, I made sure to tell you about terminal or internal alkynes and the reason why internal alkynes are or sorry uh, terminal alkynes are so important is because that proton has a pKa of around 25 and so it's pretty acidic compared to you know a, um, a vinyl proton let's say or a proton on an, on, an, on an alkane you know which has a pKa of 50 okay so um, we're gonna see how we can take or use that acidity of that uh, terminal alkyne proton to our advantage later on in this uh, chapter. So let's try some nomenclature. These aren't meant to be, you know, mind boggling questions or anything. But the first thing I noticed about this triple bond is if you find the longest chain that has the triple bond in it, do you notice that it's like, you know, if you go here, you have, son of a gun. If you go on this side, you've got one, two, three carbons. And if you go on this side, you've got one, two, three carbons. So the, the longest chain is actually symmetrical. So if I was to highlight I'm going to highlight one end in, I don't know, in uh, red, and then I'll highlight the other end in green. And it's not a trick question. Could anybody tell me which end I would start on to start numbering it if I want to do it correctly? Does anybody have? Yeah, it's going to be the red end, right? Because whenever you have this kind of situation where it's a tie, you know, both ends, you know, you're going to get the same number for the, um, for the first carbon of the triple bond. Well, in that case, you would want to give the substituent the lowest possible number, right? You kind of go down in the rules. So you'd start from the end that's red. So we're going to do it like this. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So this is some kind of three hexine, or you could call it a hex, 
three ein, either either one is fine. But uh, you've got a two methyl, so we've got two methyl three hexine, just like that. Okay. And again, you could call it two methyl hex three ein. Either one is perfectly fine. Uh, the next one, we have the longest carbon chain, which you can see starts on the terminal carbon of the of the terminal alkyne. So one, two, three, four. No, sorry, one, two, three, four. There we go. Like that. Again, we want to give the carbons in the triple bond the lowest possible number. So we're going to start here with one, two, three, four. We've got a three, three dimethyl. So three, three dimethyl. And then we've got one. One butyne. Okay. And then of course you could also call this three three dimethyl but one ine. Either one is perfectly acceptable. There's no problem with either of these. So this is 9.1b and this is 9.1d if you want to take a look at the solutions manual. So there you go. That's a little bit of practice with some alkyne nomenclature. And of course, you want to take a look at the other problems where you get to practice your alkyne nomenclature. And let's talk about the acidity of terminal alkynes. I've already kind of brought this up um, a couple of times. Uh, it says here that recall that terminal alkynes have a lower pKa, which means they're more acidic than other hydrocarbons, right? Ethane, ethylene, and acetylene, these are all just hydrocarbons, all right? But you see that acetylene is 19 pKa units more acidic than ethylene. So that's 10 to the 19 times stronger acid is what acetylene is compared to um, ethylene. You know, how would we rationalize this? If you go back to Aereo, you guys remember Aereo, atom, resonance, induction, orbital. Well, if we think about the conjugate base that would result, if we were to deprotonate any one of these, you can't use A, you can't use atom because the negative charge would be on the on carbon in all of them. You can't use resonance because there's no resonance structures. You can't use induction because there's no inductive effects here. So you'd have to go with what? You got to go with orbital. That must be the way that we explain that. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But acetylene can be deprotonated using a strong base to form what's called an acetylide ion. So an acetylide ion. So there's a difference between an acetylide ion. That's when you have a hydrogen. And if you have an R group like this, because we're going to see this as well. And I just want to get some termination term terminology out of the way. We call this an um, uh, we call it an alkanide. So an alkanide ion. Okay, so you got to know the difference between an acetylide ion and an alkanide ion. So again, we can take a strong base since the pK of this proton is 25. If we have the appropriate base, we can rip that proton off to make an acetylide um, ion. And as I told you on the last slide. We're going to use orbital from Aereo to explain why um, acetylene is a stronger acid than ethylene, um, which again is stronger than ethane, right? If we compare their pKa. So it says, recall here that alkynes have a lower pKa. Now, why would that be? It's got nothing more to do than, um, it can just simply be explained by the hybridization theory, right? The hybridization of, um, of the carbon, of the conjugate base, right? Here we have an sp3 orbital. Well, in an sp3 orbital on an alkane, right? What's an sp3 orbital made from? It's only 25% s, right? And it's 75% p. Whereas in an sp2, it's about 33% s, and it's about 66% p. And then you go over to the sp orbital, and it's 50-50, right? It's 50% s, and it's 50% P. Well, the reason why um, the acetylide ion is so much more stable is because it's got more S character and S orbitals are just smaller and it's going to keep that lone pair closer to the nucleus of the carbon. And that's the answer. Okay, it's nothing more than that, right? What's the charge of a nucleus? Positive. It's got protons and neutrons in it. And so when we have those electrons closer to the nucleus, of this carbon is all it's saying, it's just closer to the nucleus. Well, if it's closer to the nucleus, it's gonna be more stable, right? If we have the sp3 orbital, it's bigger, 
the lone pair is further away, so it's not as stabilized. And that's how you rationalize the difference in acidity as we go from an um, uh, sp3 hybridized carbon to sp2 to sp. I think that's the rationale as to why alke alkynes rather are so much more acidic than alkenes and alkanes. So how would how do we deter how do we deprotonate rather an alkyne? What do we do if we have a terminal alkyne? What do we have to do? Well, here's an option. What if we were to try to use sodium amide? So Na NH2, that's sodium sodium amide is what it's called, right? And I think I've brought up the amide ion with you. Yes, I know there's also a functional group, which is this, which is, you know, this is an amide, right? Functional group, but this is called the amide ion, NH2 minus, and it's a strong base, okay? If we take a look at the relative pKa's of the acid and the conjugate acid over here, well, the pKa of the terminal alkyne is 25. We've discussed that already, but the pKa of ammonia, which we saw way back in chapter three, is 38. Well, the equilibrium is gonna lie to the side of the weaker acid. So what does that tell you? It tells you that sodium amide is, a, is an effective base at deprotonating a terminal alkyne. What's another really common base in chemistry, right? Go back to Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2. Sodium hydroxide, right? You use it for everything, okay? Well, can you use sodium hydroxide to deprotonate a terminal alkyne? Well, let's take a look at the pKa's. We draw the curved arrows for the proton transfer. We draw the conjugate acid. We draw the same conjugate base. Well, if we compare the pKa of the acid and the co conjugate acid, this time, the alkyne is the weaker acid. So the equilibrium is actually gonna to lie to this side over here. What does that tell you? It tells you that hydroxide, whether it's sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, it is not going to remove um, the terminal proton of the alkyne. It's not gonna do it. So you've gotta use a really strong base like sodium amide. And in fact, if you're wondering, you know, are there other bases that we could use? Yes, there are, and they will come up. So. A terminal alkyne can be deprotonated by a suitable base. Again, sodium amide is the one we're going to use most of the time. I'm going to say 99% of the time, probably. Um, but uh, there are others that can be used as well to do that. So here are some other options, okay? So besides the amide ion, right? So you would get that from sodium amide, okay? Another option would be to use a butyl carbanion. So you would get that from butyl lithium. So you abbreviate that BU for butyl and then LI for lithium, right? Because it's not showing the cation here, but obviously there is one, okay? And another option would be a hydride, which we usually get from sodium hydride, so NaH. So the three bases that you would use to deprotonate a terminal alkyne would either be butyl lithium, which is pyrophoric, means it, it, it ignites in, in air, um, sodium amide, which again is the one we're going to use the most. Okay, so I'll highlight that one in yellow. And then sodium hydride, which we will use from time to time. From time to time, that might show up. Okay, uh, there you go. So butyl lithium, sodium hydride, not used as much in our textbook, but they are used. Sodium amide, used all the time. Right, and also all these alkoxide bases, things that we used all the time in chapter seven sodium ethoxide, potassium t-butoxide, hydroxide, those won't work. They're just not strong enough. Simple as that. All right. So there you go. So if you want to know um, whether something is going to be an effective, you know, effective at deprotonating a terminal alkyne, all you have to do is this. Just evaluate the strength of the, the, um, the alkyne, which is, has a pK of 25, and then just evaluate the conjugate acid that's formed. It's going to lie to the side of the weaker acid, and that'll explain to you, you know, whether the deprotonation is going to occur or not, okay? But again, I would try to memorize these ones here. You know, butyl lithium is something that you would never use in an undergraduate lab. Like, if you were to walk into, you know, chemistry 3112 or chemistry 3102, it's something that you would never see used in a university undergraduate lab. But like I said, it's pyrophoric. That means it ignites in air, okay? It comes as a solution in hexane, but if it gets exposed to any oxygen, it will just poof, start a fire. So you want to be very careful with that. There, in fact, there was a graduate student in California a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, um, who died by using butyl lithium. It got all over her lab coat and it caught on fire. It was a horrible accident, but that just shows you how dangerous some of these 
reagents can be. Sodium amide, again, is just ubiquitous in this chapter. It's something that, I'll be honest, I haven't used many times in my life, and it's actually not that convenient of a base. If I had to choose one of these, my own personal self, I would choose sodium hydride. It's relatively safe to handle. Um, normally, we weigh out sodium hydride under, a nitrog under nitrogen, and there's techniques for doing that. If you've seen the glove box like Homer Simpson uses at the beginning of The Simpsons, well, we don't, I'm not talking about radioactive materials, but you can use that as an inert environment to weigh out a solid like this. But um, sodium hydride will come, it's 60% dispersion, dispersion, dispersion in oil. So it actually comes like in oil. And then you can wash the oil off of it. So that's, and the reason they do that is because if they don't put it in oil, it is pyrophoric. It'll just poof, catch on fire. So um, the reason I'm telling you this is not because I'm going to ask you about it on the quiz. It's just, you know, when we're doing organic chemistry on paper, it's very easy to say, oh, I'll just throw some butyl lithium at it. But in fact, it takes a lot of preparation to do that. You have to make sure all your glassware is dry, right? Anyhow, just some interesting stuff there. All right. This question here just says, you know, um, are, are these bases sufficiently strong to deprotonate the terminal alkyne? After that spiel that I just gave you, I'm sure that you can answer it without evaluating any, um, without evaluating any PKs, but let's just do it for fun. Um, the first one is amide. Of course, we know that's going to work. Why do we know that? If you were trying to explain this to, a, to say somebody who's uh, maybe, you know, somebody who's a friend that's taken Gen Chem 2, you'd say, well, what happens is when you deprotonate this, you end up with a conjugate base, which looks like this. Okay, let me make sure I draw it out here correctly. Plus, you'll end up with the conjugate acid. Now, the conjugate acid has a pKa of around 38, and um, the terminal alkyne has a pKa of around 25. Well, the equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the weaker acid, which is this one, right? The higher the pKa, the weaker the acid, so the equilibrium is going to lie to this side. And so, yes, um, amide is going to eff effectively uh, um, deprotonate. Now, in terms of the next one, if you want to draw a mechanism for that, we'll draw the hydride ion. I'll use a blue pen this time, and we'll show. Oops, that's not where the proton is. There you go. There it is. Okay, we're going to deprotonate like this. We draw the conjugate base, which is going to be this terminal alkanide, right? And then we end up with H2. Now, H2 gas, hydrogen gas, does have a pKa. Its pKa is equal to 35. So you might want to try to memorize that. So the equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the weaker acid. Again, the pKa here of that proton on the terminal alkyne is 25. Same thing here. The pKa is equal to 25. And check this out. Here's the reason why this won't work. Because if we draw the conjugate base and the conjugate acid, which is tert butanol, even if you weren't exactly sure what the pKa of tert, tert butanol is, what's the pKa of an alcohol? It's around I don't know, 15, 18, maybe. You're, you're not going to get the wrong answer anywhere in there. Let's say the pKa is 15. Okay, well, it's going to lie to the side of the weaker acid, so it's going to lie to this side. So the answer is no, it will not work. The answer to the second one was also yes. But the answer to the last one is no, it won't work. OK, so again, the three bases that would be appropriate and you could try doing the same exercise with butyl lithium and you'll prove that, you know, butane has a pK of 50. So it definitely will lie to the side of butane. Uh, again, the bases are going to be sodium, amide, sodium hydride or butyl lithium. All oops, all three of those will work. And if you're wondering, you know, are there others? Of course, you know, there are others out there, but we're not going to do an exhaustive list. All right. Now we're going to talk about synthesis a little bit. And the first thing we want to talk about is how do you make an alkyne? Sure, you can just purchase some alkynes from a chemical supplier. You just send an order. They show up with a delivery truck and you get a bottle that's got the alkyne maybe that you want. And you do a little party, you know. But uh, what if you can't get it from a chemical supplier? What if you're, you know, doing research? It's, it's something that's new, that's never been done before. Well, in that case, you might need to make an alkyne, so you've got to come up with some kind of strategy. Hopefully, you remember that back in uh, the alkenes chapter, chapter eight, we said, well, if we were to take a strong base, right, a really strong base, let's say we'll put a negative charge here, we can do an E2 reaction, right, where you do an E2 elimination like this. And again, that was covered 
way back in um, in chapter eight, section eight point seven. Well, we can do what's called a double elimination if you have a dihalide, right? To do the E two to make an alkene. I didn't mention this, but you have an alkyl halide. So if you have two hydro or two halogens rather on the same carbon, you can do a double elimination. And this proceeds exactly how you think it would, okay? The first equivalent of the base, and I'll just kind of do it quickly here. The first equivalent of the base is gonna rip off one of the protons. You do an E2 and you're gonna end up with an intermediate that looks like this, where you've got your R group, your carbon, you've still got the other bromine, and then you've got this carbon, a hydrogen, like this. So you end up with this intermediate. And then the next equivalent of base, I'll use a blue arrow this time is just gonna do another elimination like that. So it's like it's like a double a double E2 reaction. It's essentially what you're doing, right? One E2, and then you do the second E2 to make an alkyne. So there's one way to make an alkyne, but in terms of that dihalide, it doesn't matter if both of the halogens are on the same carbon or if they're on adjacent carbon. So they can be geminal, and I this is the mechanism that I just drew on the last slide, okay? They can be geminal, right? Gemini, twins, they can be on the same carbon, or they can be vicinal, which is means next door neighbors, right? They can be on adjacent carbons. And you could try drawing the mechanism for that. It's the exact same double elimination, right? The first equivalent of your base, okay, here's your strong base. It's going to do the deprotonation like that. You could try to draw the intermediate and then draw the second E2 um, reaction to make your alkyne like that. So again, how do you make an alkyne? Well, the first way that we've learned is to basically do a double E2 and you can use a geminal or a vicinal dihalide. Either one is going to work. Okay, so if you have the two halogens on a carbon that possesses a hydrogen on it already, this is probably the easiest way to make an alkanide ion. So to make a, um, and to functionalize at the, the carbon, anyhow, we'll talk about that more. But it says here, what if you use excess sodium amide? Let's think about this for a second. If you use sodium amide as your base, remember how back here I just said base, you know, over here I just said, oh, B minus, whatever. Well, if your base is sodium amide, for example, okay, you do the double elimination, well, then what would you end up with, okay? In this case, if you have a hydrogen on that carbon with the two halogens, you end up with a terminal alkyne. Well, hold on. If you're using a bunch excess, so that means more than two equivalents, if you're using a bunch of more sodium amide, well, hold the phone. I mean, you've got a wicked acidic proton here. I mean, relatively speaking, this has got a pKa of 25, and you've got some more sodium amide sitting around. Well, what's that going to do? That's going to rip that proton off like stink. Okay, it's going to rip it off like nothing. So you actually don't stop here, right? This is where you want to be, but you don't stop there. You're going to keep doing um, deprotonations and you're actually going to end up with an alkanide. And so when you want to make that alkyne, you always have to add water at the very end. Why? Because if you throw water in the reaction mixture, the alkanide is going to behave as a base. It's going to rip a proton off the water and then you form the terminal Alkyne. Well, if you compare the pKa of water and the pKa of the terminal alkyne, it's going to lie to the side of the terminal alkyne. Pretty cool, huh? So essentially, it's a two-step process. Here we have a geminal dihalide. And again, notice that we've got a hydrogen here. So what's going to happen is we're going to deprotonate using excess sodium amide. And for a solvent, we put it in liquid ammonia. Okay, so this is excess sodium amide in ammonia. And then what you end up with after the first step is this. You actually end up with this, okay? You end up with the alkanide. So then after the second step, you do the protonation with water, and then you end up with the terminal alkyne like that. Pretty cool, huh? You think about it. So there's one thing that I didn't put in my slides, and I made a note for myself here. It's that I have some questions here for us to look at. And there's one question that I don't have in my slides but I would like everybody to be sure to look at, and it's question 9.8. So if we have time in the next class, maybe we'll take a look at question 9.8, but that's one, it's one of the few questions that I don't do in class or I don't have it in my slides, but I want you to take a look at that because 
it's a very interesting scenario where you have the geminal dihalide um, and then um, you end up um, rearranging the alkyne in order to make a terminal alkanide anyhow. Uh, or ter yeah, terminal alkanide. Anyhow, we'll talk more about that later, but make sure you try this question before the next class. Okay. Anyhow, it says here for each of the following transformations, predict the major product and draw a mechanism for its formation. We've got a geminal dihalide in the first one. We're treating it with excess sodium amide. So what we're going to do first is we're going to rip off one of these beta protons, so to speak, right? If we consider that an alpha carbon, you can think of this as a beta carbon, right? This is a beta carbon, but there's no protons on it. So we'd have to start by ripping off, you know, one of the three protons here. So we have our amide ion, and I think I'm going to run out of space here. But anyhow, we're going to do the first elimination. So we'll rip off one of the protons. We do an E2, and that gives us an intermediate that's going to look like this. So let me make sure I don't goof it up here. I got the double bond now. I've got these two hydrogens, and I've got my bromine. There we go. Now, another equivalent of sodium amide and the amide ion is going to come in as my base and it's going to rip off another proton. I do another elimination. Now it looks like I'm done, doesn't it? You're like, hey, I've got a I've got a, a, um, a terminal alkyne. My life is good. You know, I'm done. Well, no, you're not, because let me show you here. You've got a proton on here and you're using excess sodium amide. So what's the next equivalent of amide going to do? You have more amide in there. It's going to rip off that proton. So then you're going to throw and rip that proton off. Now you've got your terminal alkanide. Okay. Your alkanide ion, I should say. If it's, al it's an alkanide, it's terminal. Anyhow, and then in the next step, you throw water in like this. Okay. And then you're going to rip that proton off like this. And then you're going to end up with your final product. I knew I'd run out of space, but this is your final product. Come on, you. There we go. And there you go. There's your final product. So we're going to have to switch over to a blank document to give the next one the old college try. But again, it's just a double E2 followed by um, uh, a protonation, right? After the deprotonation, you just throw water in. So again, in the first one, we had a geminal dihalide, but now it's vicinal, isn't it? Vicinal. All right. There we go. All right, so let me switch over to a blank document here. And we'll give this the old college try. So this is um, B. So what's our molecule? It looks like this. So we've got this and this. We've got a chlorine here, and then we have another chlorine there. All right, so we're treating this with excess sodium amide and ammonia. And then in the last step, we're going to put water on it. OK, so let's do the first elimination. I mean, it wouldn't matter if you were to rip off this proton that I'm writing in blue or if you were to rip off this proton that I have in red, doesn't matter. And then there's a proton in green that we're gonna deprotonate as well to make the alkanine. Doesn't matter what order you pull the, you know, you just need to do both eliminations. So let's start with that. So we'll write amide, the amide ion. We're gonna do the double elimination. So we'll rip off the red proton first. So we make that double bond and we're gonna lose the chlorine on the end. That's going to give us this intermediate, just like this. So there we go. We've got our chlorine here. And we still got these two hydrogens. So we have more amide kicking around. All right, it's excess. That means more than enough. So we'll draw another amide ion. It's a strong base. It's going to rip off a proton. We make the double bond. We lose. The leaving group. Now we've got our triple bond. Okay. Oops. Keeps doing that. Got our triple bond like this, but we still have that proton on the end. I mean, this is our final product that we're going to end up with, but the me mechanism isn't done yet, is it? Right? Because you have so much amide in there that it's going to pull off that proton. So we pull that off. 
and we make the alkanide. So here's my alkanide. There we go with my negative charge. And then in the last step, I'm going to put water in it in the reaction mixture. And this is going to behave as a base. It's going to pull a proton off like this. And I'm going to end up with my final product, which is this guy. There you go. All right. Nothing to it. Just a double elimination followed by adding water. When you put water in at the end of a react at the end of a reaction sequence, I should say, in organic chemistry, a lot of times we call this a quench. We call this quenching the reaction when you put water in it. And a quench doesn't necessarily mean like quenching your thirst, like it's always water. Sometimes you can quench a reaction with, you know, something else, some kind of um, electrophile. Anyhow, there you go. So that covers what? The synthesis of <clears throat> an alkyne by starting out with either a geminal or a vicinal dihalide. And be sure again to take a look at that question, question 9.8, before our next lecture. It's a really interesting one. I think I'll put it in my slide deck for the next time. But anyhow, there we are. So we discussed all the bases that can be used besides sodium amide. And like I told you, yes, you can use butyl lithium. Yes, you can use sodium hydride. But as you can see in the textbook, he uses the excess sodium amide in ammonia. And like I said, 99% of the time. All right, well, let's talk about reduction of an alkyne. Remember, we talked quite a bit about hydrogenation of an alkene. And just to refresh your memory, I'll scribble it up here. All right, if you start with an alkene, let's say you have the trans alkene like this, and you treated it with hydrogen and palladium, platinum, or nickel, right, then you would make the alkane. So that's what... <clears throat> Reduction of an alkene is or hydrogenation. Well, we can do a catalytic hydrogenation on an alkyne the exact same way. If you take an alkyne like this, this is 2-butyne, two 2-butyne, two right? Because this would be 1-butyne, okay? Anyhow, um, if you take 2-butyne, you treat that with hydrogen, platinum, and it could be palladium or nickel, doesn't matter. You're going to completely hydrogenate that to, in this case, you'd end up with butane. Which is a gas, but anyhow, um, and that's a useful reaction uh, depending on the circumstances. If you want to make an alkane, sure, it's great, but um, you might be wondering, you know, could you just do, you know, the addition of one equivalent of hydrogen so that you could end up with an alkene? The answer is yeah, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But with respect to the mechanism of this complete or exhaustive hydrogenation, the first step does produce a cis alkene. But the thing is, it's so reactive that it just keeps going, okay? The conditions are such that this is not going to be isolated. You do the syn addition of the two hydrogens, and we talked about how the alkene, and in this case, the alkyne, approaches the surface of the catalyst like a UFO landing, and then the, you know, the hydrogens get attached. So it's the same type of deal, but once you produce that alkene, it just, whew, it just keeps going to an alkane. So it won't stop. So what happened is, you know, scientists worked for a long time to come up with a way to get the reaction to stop at the alkene. And of course, it's going to stop at the cis alkene because hydrogenation, of course, occurs at the surface of the catalyst. And what we do is we used what's called a poisoned catalyst. OK. Poison just means that you take the catalyst and you add something to it. And poison catalysts can vary. So it says here. Um, if you want to stop at the cis alkene, you use a poison catalyst. And the two poison catalysts that comes up, that come up rather in our textbook, are Lindlier's catalyst. Lindlier is a person's name. Okay, Lindlier developed it. And then there's another one called the P2 catalyst. Okay, so Lindlier's catalyst. If you Google Lind Lindlier's catalyst, and you don't have to at all, um, you'll see again that Lindlier's catalyst kind of varies. Okay, there's there's variations on it. But the idea is that it always does the same thing. It gets the hydrogenation to stop at the cis alkene. So Lindlar's catalyst is um, it's basically palladium. But on the surface of the palladium, they have sometimes barium. It's not always barium. Sometimes it can be calcium, like from calcium carbonate. OK, um, and then you have this interesting molecule here, quinlan. All you I'm never going to ask you to regurgitate that ever. All I'm going to ask you to say is Lindlier's catalyst. I've taught this class long enough to know that my students, instead of writing poison catalyst, they just write H2 in Lindlier's, okay? And I know exactly what they mean. If you write Lindlier's catalyst, abbreviated like that, 
I'd give that 100%. The whole P2 complex, which is this boron nickel complex, uh, the book doesn't go into any detail about that at all. But um, the reason why I think it's important that you put this in this feather in your cap, even if you don't use it a lot when you're studying, I'll tell you where this comes up. You guessed it on things like the MCAT. Okay. Um, I've looked around the DAT study materials and the PCAT and the MCAT materials enough to know that our textbook uses this like almost never, but he probably does mention it because the MCAT and those other standardized exams, sometimes they'll write NI2B, like this P2 um, complex, and the student has to know that that's what it's going to do. It's going to produce a cisalkene, okay? Again, you probably won't hear me mention it again because it's never mentioned in, um, in our book, really. It doesn't come up a whole heck of a lot. Something else that's kind of an aside is the lead, okay? The source of the lead can be like lead acetate or it can be from lead chloride. But again, all you need to know is Lindlar's catalyst gives you a cisalkene, okay? That's really it, okay? Nothing more than that. And, you know, if you want to look at the reaction coordinate, you're like, why does this happen? Well, basically, all that happens is Lindlar's catalyst, the poison catalyst or the P2 catalyst, um, it catalyzes the first addition, but the second one, it doesn't. Okay, so it stops. And, you know, again, our book doesn't go into a lot of the detail as to why it won't catalyze this step. In fact, I'm not even sure if it's all that well known. I mean, there might be some ideas as to why it is. But anyhow. You're, I mean, you go all the way back to Gen Chem 1. What did you What did you talk about when you learned about, you know, ways to speed up a reaction? You learned a catalyst. And you said, well, a catalyst lowers activation energy, which it clearly does here. You have this huge activation energy, which, get, which gets diminished, you know, greatly. But also, it provides a different pathway, doesn't it? Right? You have this, this different pathway. So there you go. That's all that happens with catalytic hydrogenation. Now... Catalytic hydrogenation using Lindlar's catalyst, the poison catalyst, or the, the, the nickel boron complex. Again, those produce the cisalkene. Is there a way to make the transalkene? Absolutely, there is. Okay, there's a way to do it. It's completely different. It doesn't involve hydrogenation, it doesn't involve any catalysts whatsoever. It actually involves using sodium metal. So, this is called dissolving metal reduction. Now, if I'm sure somebody in the class has gone on the internet and has looked up what happens when you start messing around with sodium, right? Because sodium is a solid at room temperature. It's, it's a metal. It's a metal that you can cut with a knife. I mean, you can cut it with a, you know, a plastic knife, really. But um, messing around with sodium is not all that fun because sodium is so reactive in air. I mean, it won't explode in air, but if you've ever seen somebody throw sodium in water, well, that will definitely, uh, can definitely start a fire. So you've got to dissolve sodium metal in liquid ammonia. So this is done at cold temperature because ammonia has a boiling point of like minus 33 degrees Celsius or something like that. So you've got to do this at a pretty cold temperature, but you take it and you treat it with um, sodium metal and liquid ammonia and you end up with the transalkene. Kind of cool, huh? And, you know, when we talk about the hydrogenation, I said, well, you get the cis and, you know, a little hand waving, not sure exactly, 100% sure about the, the catalyst, well, this is a mechanism that is well understood, okay? It says the reaction is stereoselective for the anti-addition of the two hydrogens, right? One is added to one side of the, the molecule, the double bond, the other one's added to the other side. So this is, you know, um, stereoselective. And the reason why is because of an intermediate that's produced called a radical amide, okay? I'm not going to ask you to draw the mechanism of the formation of the radical anion, but I want you to know what a radical anion is, okay? A radical anion has a radical, which is an unpaired electron, and then it's got an anion in it, okay? It's got both of these things in the same intermediate. So check this out. In order to make the transalkene, you get a rat, or sorry, in order to reduce um, using sodium metal, you end up with a radical anion. So you end up with an anion on one of the carbons of the double bond, so this is the anion, and then this is the radical, right? This is a radical here, an unpaired electron. Well, an unpaired electron has a negative charge, right? And electrons are negative, and the anion is obviously negative. So all that happens is that 
the radical and the anion want to get as far away from each other as possible to reduce repulsion. That's all they're trying to do. And that's why you end up adding a hydrogen here and here and making a transalkene. If you end up with the cis radical anion, if you will, the repulsion is so great that it's just, you know, disfavored. Okay. So it says here in my notes, I specifically said, look over mechanism 9.1. 9 you don't have to memorize it because we're going to look at radicals in more detail in chapter 10, but I wanted to make some sense to you. And again, it's just based off of the radical anion intermediate. There we go. So what have we learned so far in terms of reductions of alkynes? Well, this is the first thing that you ever learned with respect to reduction, which it was covered back in, um, in the alkenes chapter. So we said, okay, well, we can reduce an alkene to an alkane using hydrogenation. Well, you can do the same damn thing with an alkyne, right? Works as well, okay? The difference is now we've learned a way to go from an alkyne to a cis-alkene using Lindlar's catalyst, and we've learned how to go to a trans-alkene using sodium in liquid ammonia. So that's the called dissolving metal reduction. And, of course, it doesn't matter a hill of beans if you have a cis or a trans-alkene. You can just hydrogenate that straight away to the to the alkane. Okay, so these are really the two new reactions that we're going to focus on um, that we've covered this morning. Okay, in the past few minutes. So, identify the reagents that you would need to achieve each of these transformations. We're starting with an alkyne, so we're starting with this alkyne, and we want to make a cis alkene. So for that, we'd use the poison catalyst, right? Lindlar's catalyst. And so all you have to write is this. You just write hydrogen and just write Lindlar's, Lindlar's catalyst. And that's good enough. And if you want to write poison catalyst, that works too. The next one, we're going from the alkyne to the transalkene. So for that, we use dissolving metal reduction. So you write down sodium and ammonia, and then you put L next to it like this, which indicates that it's in the liquid phase. Okay. And that denotes that it must be at cold temperature because, again, um, ammonia boils at around minus 33. I just noticed something in my notes here. This is a mnemonic, I guess, that my students gave me a few years ago. As they say, dissolving uh, metal reduction using sodium. They said sodium. You write the letter N like this. Sodium metal reduction. right? And you can tell that this is a transalkene. So I don't know if that helps you or not. But uh, I don't know. I like any kind of tidbits that my students can give me are great. The next one, we're going from an alkyne to a transalkene. So again, we're going to use dissolving metal reduction, the so sodium and liquid ammonia. And then the last one, could anybody tell me what conditions I would take to convert that um, alkyne to an alkane? And again, I'm not trying to fool you or anything or mess up your life. What conditions would you use for that? There you go. Thanks, Mackenzie. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. We use hydrogenation and platinum or palladium or nickel. Yes, Kelly, absolutely. You're 100% correct. Absolutely. Okay. All my students are correct. So, yeah, just a straight ahead hydrogenation. All right, nothing to it. Just doing some good old hydrogenation. I'll tell you a quick thing about hydrogenation. A lot of hydrogenations, and I showed you this. When I introdu introduced the subject of hydrogenation, I said you can just use a party balloon and you literally put a needle into your reaction flask like this and you stir your reaction around like this. So the hydrogen gas is actually, you know, just the pressure of the party balloon is the hydrogen gas that's going down on the reaction mixture like this. So you have all the hydrogen molecules here and then they get absorbed on adsorbed onto the palladium in the reaction mixture. But when I was working in Boulder, when I first immigrated to the United States a number of years ago, I was working in Big Pharma in Boulder and uh, I was hired as a bench chemist. So I did a lot of reactions up there. And one day I had to do a hydrogenation. And I just uh, asked, asked uh, you know, people that I worked with, I said, hey, where do I do, is there a hydrogenation room here? And they said, yeah, it's upstairs. I said, okay, it's interesting. So. I went upstairs and they had this big giant tanks of hydrogen. So you can imagine you got to be very careful around these big, big tanks with a regulator on it, you know, 
these huge tanks. So I don't know, how do you draw a regulator like this? But either way, there's hydrogen gas and there's a lot of it. And they said, the reason that we put the hydrogenation room for doing hydrogenation experiments, the reason we put it on the top floor of the building is because the roof is designed with a hinge on it. So the roof at the top of the building was designed so that if there was an explosion, it would open like, whoosh, it would open this side and then it would open, whoosh, it would open this side and it would basically, you know, you have your explosion whoosh, here, right? And it would pop the roof open. And they said it was designed that way on purpose so that the roof would blow open and it would mitigate destruction around there. So, you know, it's only the poor person who's doing, maybe, you know, who's doing the hydrogenation who would get injured and then it would mitigate, you know, destruction to the rest of the building. So you want to be careful when you're messing around with hydrogen gas. Now, if you're wondering, you know, hey, Mr. Dion, you always seem to say, well, chemists have designed a way to do this safer. Is there, are there options to using hydrogen gas? The answer is yes. There are a couple of options, but they don't work a lot of the time. So a lot of the times organic chemists today will still use hydrogen gas quite routinely. Anyhow, kind of interesting there.